Incarceration, one of the oldest forms of punishment, has witnessed remarkable evolution over the centuries. Prison facilities tasked with holding notorious criminals have adapted to the modern age, employing advanced and sometimes primitively simple security measures beyond mere bars and guards. However, while there are many prisons where the health and safety of inmates are paramount, there are other prisons whose reputation makes prisoners shiver with dread. Let us take a look inside U.S. toughest prison. ADX Maximum Security Prison When the United States Bureau of Prisons opened the ADX Maximum Security Prison in 1994, it did so intending to enhance the much-condemned isolation and sensory deprivation techniques on prison inmates. You see, ADX's entire structure was modeled after the United States Penitentiary at Marion, a prison that was built to replace the infamous Alcatraz. While Marion Prison had been condemned for its treatment of prisoners by Amnesty International, ADX was set up to improve, and even better, these inhumane techniques. Prisoners who find themselves at ADX will have to face the reality of a permanent lockdown with little to no contact with anybody else. At ADX, prisoners eat, sleep, and defecate in their cells. When new inmates arrive at ADX, their criminal history determines the cell units where they will be placed. Although these units are grouped from the most restrictive to the least restrictive, inmates here still spend at least 20 hours daily locked alone in their cells. ADX prison cells measure 7 by 12 feet and feature solid walls preventing inmates from seeing the interiors of adjacent cells. This is also designed to avoid any sort of contact with the inmates in neighboring cells. Each cell has a concrete bed with a thin mattress and blankets, a desk, a stool, and a stainless sink and toilet. Inmates have their baths from a shower which the guards automatically control. Each cell contains a small window that provides the cells with natural light but is tall and thin enough that prisoners can only see the sky and the nearby building. Meals are delivered to inmates three times a day by guards. Inmates at ADX spend the first three years of their sentence in their cell for an average of 23 hours a day. In the general population units, inmates get a total of 9 hours out of cell time per week. Nonetheless, most of the cells at ADX are fitted with a radio and television that provides religious, recreational, and educational programs to the inmates. However, some inmates often lose access to their television or radio as a form of punishment from the guards. The isolation technique in ADX is so strict that inmates' only meaningful human contact only occurs with ADX prison staff. The prison's design allows only one guard to control the movements of several inmates in multiple blocks by using electronic doors, cameras, and audio systems. The prison system at ADX makes it impossible for inmates to contemplate the idea of an escape since most don't even know where their cell is located within the facility. Although the isolation system at ADX often comes under heavy scrutiny, it is deemed a necessary evil because many inmates at the facility are under special administrative measures. The strict measures are put in place to deter the dissemination of classified information, which some of the inmates are privy to, which is also why inmates are limited to just one 15-minute phone call per month. Their books, newspapers, and rare face-to-face -face visits are also closely monitored by guards. Nonetheless, the psychological effects of ADX's cutthroat isolation strategy are detrimental to the inmates. The level of solitary confinement utilized at ADX often leads to more anger and mental illness in the inmates. These inmates often suffer hallucinations, with many of them instigating conversations with voices in their heads. Some suffer anxiety attacks and even self-mutilation from being locked up, often swallowing blades, broken glass, and other dangerous, sharp objects. In 2006, Eric Rudolph, the Olympic Park bomber who was responsible for a series of bombings across the southern United States between 1996 in 1998, wrote a letter to Gazette of Colorado Springs to complain about the state of ADX Supermax Prison. Rudolph, who is serving a life sentence prison term in ADX, noted that the prison exists to inflict misery and pain on inmates. In one of his letters, Rudolph said, It is a closed-off world designed to isolate inmates from social and environmental stimuli, with the ultimate purpose of causing mental illness and chronic physical conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, and arthritis. ADX prisoners have often tried to change things at the prison, with many going on hunger strikes to protest the harsh realities at the prison. Sadly, some prisoners who can't bear the inhumane treatment often take their own life. Despite all these, ADX remains a hotspot destination for many convicted criminals in the U.S. William C. Holman Correctional Facility the William C. Holman Correctional Facility is one of the oldest and most ill-famed prisons in the U.S. Located in Atmory, Alabama, Holman Correctional Facility is known as Hell on Earth for many prisoners who find themselves locked up within the walls of the penitentiary. Since it opened its doors to receive prisoners in 1969, Holman Correctional Facility has grown into one of the most dangerous prisons in the U.S. The prison has earned many nicknames, such as the Slaughterhouse, Slaughter Pen of the South, and House of Pain, due to the many atrocities, including stabbings that occurred 
occur within its walls. When Holman was built in 1969, the prison was initially scheduled to house just 500 inmates. However, the prison has been constantly receiving more prisoners than it can accommodate, adding to the violence inmate surfers within its walls. Currently, Holman is home to more than 1,000 inmates, which is more than double its intended capacity. Holman houses inmates of all custody levels, including minimum security level prisoners to maximum level. The prison is home to scores of life without parole and death row inmates. It is also the only penitentiary where all the executions in the state are conducted. Holman Correctional Facility had served as home to some notable prisoners like Henry Francis Hayes, a Ku Klux Klan member convicted in the lynching of 19-year-old Michael Donald. Courtney Lockhart, a military veteran turned robber who killed 18-year-old Lauren Burke in 2008, also resides in the facility. The prison is enclosed by two fences fitted with an electronic detection system, five armed guards who patrol the towers and patrol vehicles. Holman has 632 general population beds, 200 single cells, and 170 death row cells. Inmates in the general population sleep on bunks separated by plywood dividers that also serve as backrests. Despite being located on the Gulf Coast, where temperature rises very high, Holman is not air-conditioned. Although hundreds of industrial fans provide constant cooling down for the facility, it is not enough to make a tangible difference. Besides the threat of violence, some prison workers do not hide their desire to transfer out of Holman due to the simmering heat. In March 2016, prisoners at Holman started a riot to protest the living, conditions they were subjected to at the prison. The inmates started a fire in a prison dorm, which later led to the stabbings of both Warden Carter Davenport and a prison guard. According to reports, the prison guard had responded to a fight between two inmates before he was stabbed nine times. After entering the dorm to assess the situation, Warden Davenport was also stabbed. Thankfully, both survived the shocking attack. On September 1, 2016, months later, correctional officer Kenneth Bettis was stabbed to death while he was on duty overseeing prisoners in the dining hall. Days later, the unbearable conditions led prisoners at Holman to kickstart the 2016 U.S. prison strike, which would spread to 24 states and the participation of over 24,000 prisoners. The goal was to bring more awareness to the poor wages received by prison workers, the unsatisfying living conditions of prisoners, and the unfair use of prison labor. Sadly, the strike only received minimum attention from the media. Holman's cries for help and change finally got the attention they deserved in 2019, when Governor Kay Ivey appointed a group to help solve Alabama's prison problems. In an interview, Alabama Department of Corrections Commissioner Jeff Dunn said he wanted the study group to visit Holman's bleak conditions, saying, and I'm trying to do a little bit of compare and contrast in that this is a facility which was built just to warehouse. It was not built to give people the best shot of being a law-abiding citizen when they leave us. In January 2020, the state of Alabama announced that some parts of Holman would close due to deterioration. Also, some inmates were moved from Holman to other facilities to combat the overcrowding at the prison. Despite all these minor improvements, Holman remains a dreaded place for inmates. Twin Towers Correctional Facility Twin Towers Correctional Facility, also known as the Twin Towers Jail, is a 1.5 million square foot facility located at 450 Bauche Street in Los Angeles, California. The prison, which was opened in 1997, had been built after an earthquake damaged the city's historic Hall of Justice, which was the crown jewel of the Los Angeles County justice system. The Twin Towers Jail is one of the largest jail complexes in the U.S. due to its size and total number of inmates. Like its name, the facility has two towers, a medical services building, and the Los Angeles County Medical Center Jail Ward. The penitentiary is controlled by the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, which also provides deputies and officers who monitor the society and happenings within the walls. The availability of optical devices throughout the prison also makes it easy for the officers to monitor everything from a central control room. Nonetheless, despite the advancement in the security systems and the inhumane measures inmates are subjected to, more than 10 inmates have successfully escaped from the facility. On July 6, 2001, inmates Kevin Jerome Pullum walked out of the jail using the employee exit two hours after he had been convicted of murder. However, he was back in custody 18 days later after he was caught within a mile of the jail. The Twin Towers Jail, with its seven floors, can hold over 2,000 inmates at a time. However, as of 2013, the prison had a total number of 9,500 prisoners. Controlling the inmates and their activities often becomes a nightmarish situation for the prison workers. However, unlike similar prisons, inmates at Twin Towers Jail are generally 
generally suffering from medical or mental issues. Inmates suffering from serious health and mental issues are confined to the medical center jail ward. Those with short but intense medical and mental health find themselves in the medical services building. Surprisingly, while the dangers inmates face at many other prisons come from their fellow prisoners at Twin Towers, the threat is largely from the authorities. According to reports by the American Civil Liberties Union in 2011, four or 500 inmates had sent complaints about the prison. The deputies at the facility were accused of attacking prisoners unprovoked. The attacks on the inmates also sometimes become a collective action for the guards. The staff at the facility also reportedly taunted the prisoners with homophobic chants as they were beaten, kicked, and pepper sprayed while being handcuffed. One of the most eye-raising and concerning accounts from the report stated that guards would parade inmates who were injured after being attacked. Afterwards, the inmates would be placed in a cell to be beaten and raped by other inmates while deputies watched. Meanwhile, any inmate complaints would get swept under the rug and declared unfounded. Nonetheless, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department spokesman at the time, Stephen Whitmore, denied incidents similar to the report never happened. In another account, a prisoner who the deputies believed called them gay got his head slammed into a concrete wall, which subsequently caused a concussion and a gash that required 35 stitches. Even inmates suffering from mental illness or confined to wheelchairs were not spared from the abuse. Even more sickening is the accusation that the wardens often use psychiatric drugs to control the prisoners. In 2022, Los Angeles County paid out a whopping $11.5 million to settle two suits of negligent care at the Twin Towers Jail. The family of 67-year-old Wesley Alarcio, who was beaten into a permanent vegetative state in his cell, received $7 million. Meanwhile, the family of Randall J. Carrier received the second settlement of $4.5 million. Randall had died behind bars after failing to receive proper medical treatment for asthma. Meanwhile, the American Civil Liberties Union didn't let up in their cry for change. On April 19, 2023, a federal judge heard arguments by the group to hold Los Angeles County, the Board of Supervisors, and Sheriff Robert Luna in contempt for failing to comply with a court order to address the pitiable conditions at the Twin Towers Correctional Facility. In their motion, ACLU attorneys mentioned that mentally ill inmates were confined to chairs for days, and others slept all day on concrete floors. The attorneys who visited the prison also reported issues of unhygienic conditions like blocked toilets and sinks, littered trash, and lack of access to drinking water food, showers, or clean clothes by the inmates. Despite the state of Twin Towers Correctional Facility, it has housed some notable inmates, including rappers Freddie Gibbs and The Game. The prison also housed Paris Hilton for a few weeks and Harvey Weinstein, who was later extradited to New York, San Quentin State Prison. The discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill on January 24, 1848, changed the course of the state of California. The city was transformed as the availability of gold led to the influx of a lot of people, including thieves and murderers. The need for a bigger and vetted facility to store these prisoners led to the construction of the San Quentin Prison, one of the oldest prisons in the United States. The San Quentin State Prison is a maximum security correctional facility located near San Francisco, California. The prison complex, which sits on 270 75 acres of land is very popular for housing a high number of death row prisoners. San Quentin State Prison, which was opened in 1854, is also the oldest prison in the state and the only one that and ultimately led to the rape motivated killing of 25-year-old Armad Arbery. On a Sunday afternoon, Armad Arbery decided to go for his usual jog around Satillors in Brunswick, Georgia. Unfortunately, when he passed the a house belonging to Gregory McMichael, that was the beginning of an excruciating five-minute chase that ended lying on the streets in a pool of his blood. Gregory thought Arbery was a suspected burglar involved in several break-ins with area and subsequently called out to his son, Travis McMichael. Father and son grabbed weapons, a .357 Magnum handgun and a shotgun, got into a pickup truck and launched a chase on Arbery. They were quickly joined by their neighbor, William Bryan, who followed in another pickup truck. Together, the tree Arbery down for about five minutes and unsuccessfully attempted to cut him off with their trucks. In a cell phone video recorded by Brian, Arbery's last moments are captured as the chase comes to an end. The half-minute video shows how Arbery gets into a struggle with Travis after they manage to trap him. Travis then hits Arbery three times at close range with a 12-gauge shotgun, and the video shows the wounded 25-year-old making an attempt to run, but he eventually falls to the ground after a few steps. The incident completely shattered the once peaceful Brunswick community, and the impact of the video left many calling for swift justice. It didn't help that more than two passed without any arrests, despite the video evidence that captured the gruesome murder. However, McMichael held some influence with local law enforcement as a former Glynn County police officer and a former investigator with the local district attorney's office. 
As a result, several actors had to recuse themselves from the case in relationship with Gregory. The case was eventually taken over by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, and a state trial of the men commenced in November 1. The state superior court judge handed down life sentences to all parties in the Barbary after the jury had returned guilty verdicts for all three participants. However, McMichael was distinguished from that of their neighbor, Brian, by virtue of the duo being denied any chance of parole. Barely three months later, a judge gave an additional life sentence to Travis McMichael and Gregory McMichael after that. Besides the threat of gang violence, inmates at the San Quentin prison are also subjected to extended periods of solitary confinement. Keeping prisoners in isolation for long is a process that has regularly been criticized due to its serious psychological effects on prisoners. The prison faced a lawsuit in 2015 and had to reach a settlement, including a reduction in the use of solitary confinement and improved mental health services for prisoners. Still, despite the many shortcomings of San Quentin prison, the institution also offers a range of rehabilitation programs to inmates. Some of the programs include educational and vocational training that allows the prisoners to work in groups and also get paid for their labor. These programs also prepare inmates for life outside prison and to make it easier for them to reintegrate into society. Being one of the oldest prisons means San Quentin has housed many notable inmates over the years. Some of these high-profile inmates include Charles Manson, Scott Peterson, and serial killers like Richard Ramirez, also known as the Night Stalker, and Richard Chase, the Vampire Killer. United States Penitentiary Beaumont the United States Penitentiary. Beaumont is a high-security prison located in Beaumont, Texas. The location of USP Beaumont places the facility close to the Gulf of Mexico, and it also makes it easy for the facility to accommodate federal inmates from various regions. The prison, which was opened in 1997, is operated by the Federal Bureau of Prisons and houses just male inmates who have been convicted of serious crimes. These inmates are considered high-risk due to their violent nature. Many of these inmates have been convicted of federal offenses, from drug trafficking to other violent crimes. USP Beaumont is divided into multiple units, including maximum, medium, and minimum security units. These units are grouped to house inmates of varying degrees of security risk. The penitentiary has multiple cell blocks designed to hold prisoners. Inmates are then grouped into blocks due to their behavior and security risk. The security measures at USP Beaumont are similar to what one would expect from a high-security prison. The prison features perimeter fencing, and there are security cameras strategically placed all around the facility. Also, security guards regularly patrol the prison's controlled access points to prevent unauthorized entry. Since it began operations, USP Beaumont has gained a reputation for being one of the toughest prisons in the United States. Prisoners often refer to the institution as the site of the Thunderdome, a reference to the Mad Max Fury movie, a place where two people go, but only one leaves alive. According to some reports, guards at USP Beaumont pair up rival segregation inmates in the dome, which are 15 by 20 feet recreational cages. These inmates are then expected to fight for the entertainment of the guards. However, in 2001, the inhumane activity would lead to the death of Luther Plant, who was in a fight with fellow inmate Shannon Wayne Agofsky. According to a Beaumont guard's testimony in July 2004, Agofsky stomped on Plant's head, causing the latter to drown in his own blood in subsequent death. Assaults are also common occurrences within the walls of Beaumont, from prisoners on prisoners to staff on prisoners and vice versa. Inmate murder is a prevalent occurrence at USP Beaumont. On May 7, 2005, inmates Mowen Mosley and Joseph Ebron ganged up on inmate Keith Barnes. While Ebron held him down, Mosley stabbed Keith 106 times, killing him. Keith, who was in prison for murder and conspiracy to rob, had testified against a co-defendant, which made him a target. Mosley later committed suicide while Ebron was charged with first-degree murder and was sentenced to death. Meanwhile, another accomplice, Michael Bacote, who was the lookout guy during the assault, was charged with second-degree murder and sentenced to 28 years in prison. Inmate murder cases like this are very common within USP Beaumont. In 2020, 22, seven inmates at USP Beaumont who are members of the criminal group La Mara Salvatrucha, or MS-13, were indicted for their involvement in a prison attack on rival gang members. The attack, which occurred on January 31, 2022, was orchestrated by members of MS-13 against members of the Mexican Mafia and Surenos, and resulted in two deaths, two attempted murders, and a lockdown of all inmates in the Federal Bureau of Prisons for almost a week. The threat of violence at USP Beaumont is further heightened by the availability of 
of drugs within its walls. These substances are smuggled into the facility with the help of prison guards. Since 2003, at least five USP Beaumont staff are known to have been indicted for drug-related offenses within the facility's walls. Despite the grim realities at USP Beaumont, like other federal prisons, the institution offers a range of educational, vocational, and rehabilitative programs to its inmates. These programs also include GED classes, vocational training, and substance abuse treatments. Notable prisoners who have stayed within the walls of USP Beaumont include Adli Abdelwahab, a hedge fund manager and part owner of A&O Resource Management, who defrauded over 800 victims, a total of $100 million. USP Beaumont also houses Oscar Ramirez, Ortega Hernandez, who pleaded guilty to terrorism and weapons offenses after firing a semi-automatic rifle at the White House on November 11, 2011, to try and kill President Barack Obama, who he believed was the Antichrist. Attica Correctional Facility. If not for the unshakable reputation of violence, Attica Correctional Facility would just be another prison where inmates spend their jail terms. Attica Correctional Facility, which is located in Attica, New York, was built in 1931 as the most expensive penal facility of its time. Due to the riots that dominated the large chunks of state prisons in 1929, New York state officials concluded that a modern secure facility would solve their problem. The result of their decision was the construction of the impenetrable Attica Correctional Correctional facility, which was enclosed by a wall which is two feet thick, 30 meters tall, and topped with more than 12 guard towers. The prison soon became the largest local employer, and to this day, more than 600 guards patrol its walls. Attica Correctional Facility sits on 1,000 acres of land, and besides the prison, it also has a farm where inmates used to work. On the ground is also a cemetery where inmates who have died and no one claims their bodies are buried. Due to the security level, prisoners at Attica are considered quite dangerous, and most of them are unstable. From its inception, Attica Correctional Facility earned its reputation as an extremely harsh place to be incarcerated. Living conditions were nothing to write home about, and the prisoners also constantly suffered beating at the hands of the guards. Prisoners at Attica Correctional Facility may be serving short-term or life-term sentences, but there are no death row prisoners here. The prison can house over 2,000 inmates, but only male prisoners. One unique structural feature of the prison is the fitting of tear gas to many parts of the prison. The tear gas system is then easily easily activated in case inmates turn violent. This system is also available in the dining halls in any work area. Prisoners at the facility spend at least 14 hours every day in their cells. Bad food, abysmal medical care, cramped cells, and minimal recreation contribute to Attica Correctional Facility's bleak atmosphere. On September 9, 1971, prisoners at Attica Correctional Facility took matters into their own hands by seizing control of the institution and taking members of the prison staff as hostages. After starting a brawl and a attacking a guard, inmates were able to gain access to the central control area. Afterward, guards were beaten and taken as hostages. One guard who sustained a head injury died two days later. About 1,300 inmates came together in the D unit alongside 38 hostages. These inmates demanded better living conditions to the inhumane measures they were subjected to. After the riot started, the inmates made a list of demands and negotiated with New York's Commissioner of Corrections at the time, Roussel Oswald. After four days of negotiations and no tangible result, Attica was retaken by state police and correctional officers. Within an hour of dropping tear gas into the yard, the prison was secured. However, it came at the cost of 10 hostages and 29 inmates who died from the police shooting indiscriminately. Despite the events that led to the deadly riot, not much has changed at Attica Correctional Facility. Speaking in an interview about the special tensions about Attica, Brian Fisher, who was once correctional commissioner, said, Attica has a unique personality, in part because of the riot. There's an historical negativity, if you will, that doesn't go away. The ghosts of the riots still follow the prison around. Attica Correctional Facility still deals with issues of overcrowding and understaffing. Officers also occasionally get stabbed or suffer compound fractures by inmates. However, the staff also respond in similar language, using force to control the inmates. Meanwhile, most of the violent encounters between staff and inmates are handled internally at Attica. This unfair rule means more than 90% of any inmate wrongly or rightfully accused of assaulting an officer gets convicted. The sentence usually imposed on them is a long time in solitary confinement. Nonetheless, like every facility, Attica also has a variety of programs for its inmates, including anger management programs, alcohol and substance abuse treatment programs, and trauma programs. The institution has also served as home to a host of notable inmates, including David Berkowitz, also known as Son of Sam, a serial killer. From 1971 to 1976, Black Panther leader H. Rap Brown also called the Penitentiary Home, Orleans Parish Prison.
The Orleans Parish Prison is the main prison serving the city of New Orleans, Louisiana. The prison, which was first opened in 1837, closed in 1895 after the last prisoner left. However, it was reopened years later and has since earned a reputation as one of the worst prisons in the states. Most of the inmates who find themselves at Orleans Parish Prison are awaiting trial. However, a stint at the prison can often result in death before those inmates get to stand in front of a judge. Most of the problems at the prison revolve around the reports of several stabbings, fights, and death, which was a regular occurrence at the prison. The guards at the prison are also a huge contributor to the violence perpetrated at the institution. Prisoners at Orleans Parish Prison revealed that the guards often supplied them with drugs and would stand by and watch whenever a melee ensued. Nonetheless, the Orleans Parish Prison made its first major headlines on August 29, 2005, when Hurricane Katrina struck the Gold Coast. In a disappointing show of negligence and wickedness, the Orleans Parish Sheriff's Office abandoned the jail and its thousands of inmates in their cells with no access to food, water, and ventilation for days. According to a report by the American Civil Liberties Union, some of the inmates stood in sewage-tainted water, which rose up to their chests for days. When they returned to the prison days later, the deputies started evacuating the inmates to surrounding areas. Although there was no official death count for the prisoners who were abandoned, 517 prisoners were later registered unaccounted for by Human Rights Watch. The events of that period would later lead to the revelation of many atrocities at the Orleans Parish Prison. According to a report, Justice Department prisoners at Orland Parish Prison sometimes manage to kill themselves even though they are on suicide watch. In a single month in 2012, Orleans Parish Prison reportedly sent 23 prisoners to the ER with severe injuries such as lacerations, stab wounds, and fractures, which all emanated from violence at jail. After the Hurricane Katrina incident at the Orleans Parish Prison in 2005, the Federal Emergency Management Agency dedicated $223 million to the Orleans Parish Sheriff's Office for the restoration of its facilities. However, despite the supposed improvements, things have only worsened at the prison. The Justice Department's Civil Rights Division 2012 wrote a letter in which they noted that the Orleans Parish prison conditions have alarmingly worsened. OPP is a violent and dangerous institution with widespread sexual assaults. The facility is deliberately indifferent to prisoners with serious medical and mental health needs, they wrote. According to a federal class action suit by the Southern Poverty Law Center on behalf of Orleans Parish prison's inmates, residents of Orleans Parish Prison are subjected to an epidemic of rapes, no edible food, poor sanitation, inadequate medical care, and regular beatings by the deputies. Orleans Parish Prison is particularly hellish for inmates with mental illness, who contribute to a huge chuck of prisoners at the facility. Many of these inmates who have a disability are also exposed to a high rate of violence due to extreme vulnerability. According to SPL's lawsuit notes, when inmates are processed into Orleans Parish Prison, the prison officials suspend their medication for 30 or more days. Sadly, a side effect of this results in suicidal thoughts in many of the inmates. More shocking is that inmates with evident mental health needs are then transferred to an observation cell where they are held almost naked for days. The indifferent attitude of the guards at Orlean Parish Prison has contributed to the sorry state of the institution. Even when inmates try to get their ordeals known, they are brutally beaten by the guards. Between 2006 and 2004, inmate deaths at Orleans Parish Prison reached a sky-high figure of 44. Still, Orleans Parish Prison has served as home to some notable prisoners, including State Senator Troy E. Brown, who was in prison for domestic abuse battery from an incident with his long-term secret partner. Despite its infamous reputation and decapitated structure, Orleans Parish Prison still welcomes inmates. However, many inmates who find themselves here awaiting trial know their meeting with death might come even before they get to argue their case. For more content like this, click on the videos showing on your screen now.